was going through yeah. introductions. Okay, okay, good. I'm so Go ahead sorry. And finish up, Eric. I'm running the show now, Tiffany. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, get to it. Get to it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Katie. All right, Katie. So and I think I've got You're doing a good job. job. We will. Hey, Sunshine, we don't even need you. <laughs> oh, no. Wow. Okay, I'm gone. But I'm uh, gone. <laughs> you've been replaced, Tiffany. All right. Um, okay, so I think I've got everything straight. I think I'm good to go. But here. Uh, I was just going to finish up saying. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead, Eric. Finish I was just going to finish up by saying, like, I'm, I'm big. I'm big in the church. I really, really, really like outreach. I think what what the topic we're going to talk about is going to be huge for me. And I'm really excited to hear more about the program, hear more about the outreach, the people that you're trying to, you know, help and initiate these systems. I think that we're not doing enough throughout the country to, you know, to do more for people. Um, so I'm really, really excited to hear you know, everything that, that your organization is about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So Kenny, let's go ahead and get into it since I'm just all over the place right now. So I appreciate y'all's patience. Um, Kenny, I would really like for you to kind of start off and tell us what Freedom Fighting Missionaries is and what the, your mission and purpose is. And then I want to talk to you about what motivated you to start Freedom Fighting Missionaries. Thank you. Um, and I am Kenny Robinson, the founder and executive director of Freedom Fighting Missionaries, a 501c3 reentry organization based in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we serve justice involved individuals, their families, including men and women who are exiting jail um, and or prison. And this work derived from my own lived experience here in Charlotte, North Carolina, after serving 10 years and being released here in 2012 um, and set out to figure things out uh, on my own with uh, little to no uh, basic resources to begin a reentry journey um, and on a pathway back to prison. Um, not by no uh, crime being committed other than uh, to send a man out and to the world with nothing, only the um, clothes on his back. And that is what compelled me to push forward and fight to get myself uh, in a position to take care of myself um, and my children. And once I was able to do that, it still was on my heart to go back to assist the community. Okay. So I know that, that the last um, couple, I think believe the last few days, if not about the last week or two, you've been posting about um, you getting out of incarceration and kind of um, what started your journey. And so I'm really curious to know when it comes to getting out, what does that look like for someone that is getting out of incarceration when you got out versus now. So when you got out, were there any resources? Were, was anybody putting anything in place for you before you were released? What, what did that look like for someone that was getting out back then when you got out? Um, I got out in 2012. Um, and what that looked like then and what it continues to look like now um, across much of the United States of America, despite our efforts to uh, fight for uh, real change. What that looks like is uh, similar to what it looked like in 1865 when uh, slavery ended and uh, men and women and families were uh, all of a sudden released and told to figure it out on their own. So some um, over 200 years later uh, in the one area that is still within the Constitution uh, of this country, the 13th Amendment, which gives uh, governments the right to treat those with a felony record as less than a, than a man. Uh, we are still mm. continuing to be uh, released with nothing, uh, no four papers, no mule, um, no basic means of survival. Basic means of survival include things like identifications, uh, food, water, uh, clean air, You're free now to go. Yeah, you got safe, 
safe and affordable place to, to stay, meaningful and sustainable uh, employment, and or a pathway to uh, upward mobility. And those are the things that I faced in 2012 when I was uh, released. Uh, and the one out of about every 10,000 individuals who are released across the, uh, the country, I was one of the 10,000 that was able to navigate my way around some of the barriers in order to uh, find employment, maintain employment, and uh, lift my bootless self up by my bootstraps, right, with no boots. And once I was able to, uh, to do that, I felt compelled to assist others uh, on that pathway. Not knowing that um, we would break barriers and make changes and um, make history, but only just wanting to assist individuals to navigate around barriers, not try to break them down. Um, and we continue to do that and to do it through a lens where we are at the bottom of a uh, mountain with the pickaxe picking away. So although we have uh, made some historic uh, achievements here in Charlotte throughout reentry, it is just a chip away at, at a mountain the way that we look at it across the nation and across history. Yeah, mm. yeah. So we have um, Mr. Lorenzo Steele uh, Jr. on the line and um, he has a, um, a museum on a bus, a bus museum, um, where he shares um, images of um, those who have been incarcerated and the, the trials that um, people go through while they're incarcerated. So Lorenzo, I don't see you on camera, but I can hear you. Can you tell us a little bit you can more? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Okay, we having technical difficulties over here. Yes, um, my name is uh, Lorenzo Steele Jr. And um, I'm a former New York City Department Correction Officer. From 1987 to 1999, I worked in the infamous Rackers Island. After serving 12 years on Rackers Island, you know, there, there are things that I've seen and witnessed that still to this day traumatize me for the rest of my life. But while I was on, you know, Rackers Island as an officer, I used to carry my camera. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, just taking pictures of common areas and, you know, um, you know, things like that, not knowing that God was going to use me as a as a vessel to um, to educate and inform youth about, you know, the consequence of negative choices and decisions, um, hoping that they realize that, you know, that jail system is the last place on earth that they ever want to go to. So um, after the 12 years, I um, I went immediately into um, neighborhoods in New York City that um, if you look at the statistics, there's about six or seven communities in New York City that you have a large population that um, populate those 72 prisons in upstate New York. And I would go into those school districts uh, with the information, um, if you can imagine doing PowerPoint presentations to sometimes 500 students in the auditorium, wow. just showing them the images and the stories that actually go behind it. So I use visual art to actually change habits and behaviors that could lead to incarceration. And so um, I used to, on my spare time, I used to um, I put the photographs on easels and imagine doing an art exhibition in, in front of housing developments. And the reason that I did that is because, you know, um, statistics says, you know, black and brown people don't go to museums. So I actually brought the museum to them. And so as time went on, you know, uh, my caravan got small, the program kept evolving. And then I got divorced, came down to Charlotte, only been down here seven years and um, it still kept growing. And so I decided to get a uh, school bus and I got a grant and purchased a school bus. I painted it gray. And um, inside the bus are actually the images, installations of Rikers Island. And then I have a political side showing you the politics behind my mass incarceration, slavery, and the prison, prison industrial complex as a whole. And I also hold a uh, bachelor's degree in uh, criminal justice. So there's nothing that, um, you know, it's, it, you know, it's stopping me. I have mass information about, you know, the system, 
working in it. And what I do now is just give youth the information and um, it, it, it actually blows them away. I spoke to about 300 students today. I work in a uh, charter school and 300 students got on the bus today and um, it was amazing. Mm. Wow. That is amazing. Um, so I just met you uh, over the weekend. And when I um, when I met you, I immediately thought about the interview tonight with Kenny. And so I wanted to make sure that I connected the two of you because I think it's pretty obvious how the two of you would be able to work together and y'all would be able to um, support each other's work. But also because I just really think that what both of y'all are doing is really, really important to our community. Um, I am working currently with DJJ um, and the juveniles in Mecklenburg County, and I'm working with them to help them with um, reintegrating back into the community. And before that, I used to work with reentry adults and putting them through school, mainly CDL school and um, like HVAC and so forth, um, to help uh, those that were coming out of incarceration um, be able to provide for their families. And I just thought it was horrible, the different stories and the different um, narratives that I was hearing from the men. It was mostly men that I was helping send to school. And they were saying that, you know, they were either homeless or they had to live with family because they couldn't find a job. And, you know, they were just telling me about the the woes of getting out of incarceration and the, the lack of resources. They're, they just open a door, give you your personal belongings, and that's it. Um, and it was just something that I I just, I didn't understand. Um, I've never been in that situation before, um, God willing. But I also just really felt a deep uh, need to be able to help the reentry population. And so that's something that I've been pretty passionate about. And one of the, the reasons why I connected with uh, Kenny to begin with. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so Kenny, I just attended your gala a few months ago and um, you were celebrating a really big accomplishment. Can you tell, can you tell us about that accomplishment? Uh, well, um, that gala was a culmination of accomplishments, uh, not, not just for uh, myself, for us at Freedom Fighting Missionaries, but for our supporters who have supported this work since 2020, many of them 10, 20, and $30 um, mm -hmm. at a time um, where we uh, were celebrating um, the fact that we have made it to the point to construct and build our, um, our own housing that is specifically for justice involved individuals mm -hmm. um, and their, and their okay. families. Um, something that again has uh, never happened before in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and, you know, as I'm uh, speaking, you know, I'm always um, acknowledge our uh, achievements and accomplishments, but I'm also mindful to not let um, what we see as crumbs seem as though um, the community, the government, banks, foundations have supported this work in a, uh, in a meaningful way. So we did want to bring together um, the few. And although we had 532 people in attendance, um, I still consider that the few people in the city of uh, close to 2 million who have shown clear and concise concern for uh, a population of people who experience homelessness, who experience death, experience poverty at a much higher rate than the, the rest of the general population. Um, and, and, you know, I agreed to come on the show tonight to express those things, right? Mm -hmm. Not in anger, not in passion, but in clear data. Now, it's not my data. It is the data that is uh, compiled across many different uh, agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and although we advocate strongly, our mission statement is for criminal justice involved and formerly in incarcerated men and, and, and women. Um, it has now gotten to the point to where um, those things have become so extreme and the lack of uh, viable resources um, so bad that it is now in our children. Um, and, you know, that will just continue a cycle that I went through and that many others went through. Uh, mm -hmm. Where right now um, in 
the city of, of Charlotte currently in the CMS school system, there's 5,018 children who are currently homeless, uh, mm -hmm. accounted for as homeless in, in the McKinney-Vento system for homelessness. Um, where 76.9% of those students are black. So that means 3,717 of our children are currently experiencing homelessness where their parents and caregiver have a barrier to upper mobility that is a criminal background um, and that is generational poverty. Um, so yeah. out of that 4,815 students uh, last year, 5,018 now, um, 193 of them are white, right? Which signals to us in the city of Charlotte and Mecklenburg County that, in fact, we are doing something right when it comes to homelessness and when it comes to addressing people who have barriers because we are successfully at a 4% homeless rate amongst white um, families and children, uh, in Charlotte and Mecklenburg County. So we have proven that we can address homelessness, right? If only 4% of uh, homeless children in Mecklenburg and CMS schools are white, we're doing something right. We just need to reverse that around to the 3,717 children who, who are black. And many of them face uh, caregivers and parents who are simply unable to move forward due to uh, a shoplifting charge from 1999 or 2009 or 2019. You know, it's very typical for our minds to go towards uh, a person who has a background as being a murderer, as being a robber, as being a drug dealer. But it really doesn't matter. Um, the box is there. It wouldn't matter if you was a murderer or if you were a shoplifter. You are just simply unable to move past past that box. Um, yeah, and, you know, those is just a few things that I wanted to express and get off of my chest because these are the families that we work with today mm -hmm. where we had 11 different families contact us on just today um, mm -hmm. in assistance, mm -hmm. wow. seeking housing and seeking some of the very basic resources. Um, we actively serve around 67 percent of uh, women with children which means that we serve more single women with children than we do single men on mm -hmm. any given day, week, month. Um, and it is consistently 95% of them are, are Black and Charlotte natives. Mm. Yeah, those are some outstanding numbers. Um, and I, I have to agree, just being in social work for the last uh, 14 years and um, going into therapy that I have seen that. I've seen how, you know, working with children coming from traumatic homes that a lot of the parents have uh, charges. I've seen as little as a mom having uh, a charge, um, you know, for me being in domestic violence um, uh, uh, community from, you know, just defending herself and stabbed someone in defense um, and lost her job, lost a job that she had for 10 years because she was defending herself and she's still dealing with that and not able to get a mm. decent job while she's going through the system. So we had to connect her with a lawyer that would take her case, you know, pro bono. So mm. I see it a lot, um, you know, with people not being able to move forward, even just with the charge, not even going into incarceration. So um, I can't imagine coming out of incarceration um, after years and just you know, not having anything at all. Justice involvement, right? Um, having, having, excuse me, having went through the court system, period. Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily having very Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. So um, while we are waiting for Kenny to reconnect, um, I just wanted to talk to you, Eric, because I know that on your podcast you talk um, about politics and government and so forth. And from your end, what are you or what have you seen um, when it comes to this uh, issue that 
it's not just affecting Charlotte, but it's also affecting, I'm sure, big cities like Atlanta, too. What is your take on the prison system and, you know, those that are getting out of incarceration? Uh-oh. Statistics, we're over 80% okay. recidivism. But I mean, we're at Eric, over eighty percent recidivism. Uh, federal, come on. I might be. It's doing something. I'm trying to get my camera adjusted on this lab. Yeah, Eric, we don't we don't have bad weather here, man. You okay? <laughs> it might it might be yeah. Tiffany's connection. It, it, it should be know. working. <laughs> it's sunny out. It's, Chill. it's not me. <laughs> I'm good now. Well, we got to get an IT. We need an IT person. I know. It looks like it. It looks like it. But I can hear um, you, um, Eric. Am I back? Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. You yes. Sorry about that. My whole uh, camera fell so, and it's on the stand and everything. Oh, goodness. Well, Eric was speaking about his podcast. He um, talks about governments and politics. So he was answering my question about what what is his take on the reentry and justice involved um, crisis that we got going on? Please share that with us, Al. All right. Yeah, I, I, I just see, you know, when we're looking at crime statistics on the federal level, especially people coming out of prison, you know, we're at over 80% recidivism rate for people within 10 years of being released from prison. That's astronomical. And, and it's mm -hmm. just like what, what Kenneth, you know, said, it, it, there's the, the resources are just not there. And then you throw in the privatization of prisons. And so you lose, you lose government funds that way as well, because the government's not giving, giving that money out to the private prisons like they would a, a state run prison. So the, you have all, all those factors. And then when you look at, I look at, look at all these you know, politicians going on. It doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on, Republican, Democrat, independent, libertarian, it doesn't matter. Every single one of them shows up on an election cycle, election cycle and they show up to the black communities. They show up to the brown community. They make a thousand promises and they deliver nothing. So that's, that is a, it is a, a very, you know, big, big thing that we need to address. Like if you're going to make us a promise in this community, that's potentially an at-risk community that has issues like real life issues that, that are in need of some leadership and some resolve. If you're going to make those promises, you better deliver because the people in these communities are waiting, are waiting on leadership. They're waiting on someone to say, we're going to come in and we're going to provide resources. And the good thing is, is we have people like Kenneth that go into these communities. We're not waiting on the government to do their job. We're going to go in and, and create programs that are going to help people person by person, 10, 10 people by 10 people get to a hundred, get to a thousand. Eventually we're going to, we're going to, you know, outreach more people. So I, mm -hmm. I highly encourage. Um, and I, I didn't have a question for you, Kenneth. Did, did, do you have any pushback? from any of the law enforcement agencies in Charlotte for what you do? Good question. No. Mm, that's a great question. Um, in fact, um, one of our biggest supporters um, is the, the sheriff um, here in Mecklenburg mm. County, um, Sheriff Gary McFadden, has been very supportive um, of our uh, work um, and has uh, created programs within the detention center to ease the strain on organizations like ours. He is one of the most progressive right. sheriffs in the, you know, the history of this country when it, um, as it pertains to uh, re-entry re and second chances. Um, we do have a policy within our organization um, to uh, not ta talk about bother the police, right? We can't beat them. Right, they're a very powerful brotherhood and force, um, and we leave them alone, and they leave us alone. Right, right. Uh, but um, we try to stick to that. Uh, again, the um, detention center and the sheriff's office have 
been very supportive and um, the CMPD have been very neutral. And that mm -hmm. is a win for us right, uh, in our community. Not that they oppose or go against any of the work that, that we do, but they have their own programs that's designed to do community uh, work. Uh, and reentry just simply isn't one of them, and that's okay as long as um, they are not trying to create additional uh, barriers uh, for us. Um, so we are one of the uh, more blessed communities that we do have um, the support of the detention center and uh, and our sheriff. Uh, Tiffany, I have a question from some of my viewers. Sure. Uh, so what is one of the solution, what, what is one solution that you think government entities can implement immediately without bureaucracy if they really wanted to? They could issue direct funding to multiple reentry organizations um, on the government level and a community-based mm. organization. Billions of dollars just went into the last bill. Eric, I'm sure you was following that. And it is heading to Ukraine mm. and Israel. Billions of dollars. Billions. So the money is there. We yep. print money. Um, infrastructures are there with community-based organizations, um, even government reentry programs. Um, but we would need direct influx of funding similar to what is leaving out of the country um, mm. today to never return. That's a good question. Absolutely. Did you have any other questions, Terry? Um, where, there you go with that again. I'm telling I'm you, right? I'm you you're, you're <laughs> never gonna cards. Like, it's too many people watching this, Tiffany. Yeah, me, two cards. <laughs> Kenneth, quick question for you from my perspective. Um, this is two questions, two part. Uh, one, how long were you uh, incarcerated, if you don't mind me asking? And the second part is, um, uh, what what was the crime you were accused of i did 10 years in federal prison um, on a bank robbery conviction after two trials which means i went mm. to trial um had a mistrial in the first trial had one juror to uh, not um, vote for not guilty uh, and they tried it again i mean mm -hmm. you're talking about a, a federal system who has a nearly 99 percent conviction rate um, so if they elect to try you again, then it's uh, yeah. no holds barred. Um, and that was my first time out, first time to prison um, mm. and got 10 years. In fact, I got an extra three years for the criminal history that I did not have, right? which means that the judge in the case motioned for upward departure outside of the guidelines because okay. of the background that I did not have. Right. Um, and uh, stated that my criminal uh, history points didn't truly reflect the serious seriousness of the things I had been involved in in the past and uh, gave me an extra three years for the record I didn't have. Wow. Wow. So when you started Freedom Fighting Missionaries, what was your number one goal? Then, when you first started, what was your number one goal in starting your organization? Your to be able to assist uh, men and women who have a background um, and um, teach them how to navigate around barriers uh, similar in a way that uh, that I was able to, to do. I went to every place that you could go to looking for services mm -hmm. and looking for assistance. So um, I, in fact, knew then and I know now every place not to go, right? They just simply aren't gonna help you there. And I knew the few places and people within those places who would assist you. And my goal was to help uh, others be able to to do that and have a um, pathway towards self-sufficiency. Okay. Um, and of course, what happened happened, the pandemic came, George Floyd came, we put forth our bodies uh, men mm -hmm. and women who otherwise never was going to have a background have one now simply because of protests uh, and George Floyd and the many other uh, senseless right. murders that were carried out across the country uh, Absolutely. against people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was what compelled me to get into the work. 
um, have no control over the economy, the weather, and the things that happen um, elsewhere, but we responded to those things with our bodies where one man is, uh, two people are serving life sentences, two people are uh, no longer with us simply because of protests, right? So wow. um, we have put forth our body, our resources, sacrificed time with our own families, sacrificed our own career, I'm $400,000 in the wrong direction and lost revenue that I would have made had I not um, joined this fight and started this 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 work. Um, mm. So we don't take it lightly. Um, anytime a black man stands up for what is right in this country, historically, that man is either murdered or in prison for the rest of their life. So we know the risks that we're taking and we're taking them anyway um, for mm. the people with a goal that three to five percent of those that we serve will will um will have a pathway to up, upward mobility. So it's so dire, right, mm -hmm. that we're talking about three to five percent. We're not talking forty percent of the people we serve, sixty percent, wow. we're talking about three to five pe percent of the people that we serve that we hope would actually have a pathway to at least home ownership before they um before they die here in Charlotte, where there's a statistic right now today that states that if you are born poor here, then you are more likely to die poor here. And that's not my stat, that's their stat. Right. Um, wow. Lorenzo, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, for you, I want to ask you um, the, the number one, the number one, when you said, I'm going to do this, what was the number one reason why you did this and then i'm going to ask y'all both what has been y'all's num the number one challenges for both of y'all and your respective organizations after um, he answers that tiffany i got a question too okay another one yeah okay um wow that's a that's, that, that's a good question you know just just seeing the violence the day-to-day -day violence of of black and brown people behind bars you know um it was something that just just hit my soul and you know like i said before i did 12 years you know as an officer and um, it was unheard of at that time for Especially correctional officers, Rikers, just, right? Rikers Island. It was unheard of for officers just to leave. I resigned, no charges. Um, Twelve <laughs> years. Um, I never forget. I went to church one day, and um, as my time was winding down, before I was leaving, you know, um, there was a lot of things that was happening. Um, I didn't even want to go to work. And I, I really started to, to to see myself as an overseer on a large plantation. And I'll never forget the day that I was working in the big yard where we might have 500 to 600 inmates in the yard. And just a thought came over my mind was like, you know, what if they would run towards you, towards me, and tell me still, you know, you, you the overseer, you got the key, let us out. So right. Um, right. There were things that were going on mentally. I'll never forget took my grandmother to church one day and the pastor said, Hey, if there's anything that's stressing you, let it go. That next day, um, I turned in my gun and I turned oh. in my shield. And I'll never forget that the lady at the um the office was like, Why are you leaving? And I almost told her, I don't know. And mm -hmm. she said, Well, that, you know, that's 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 faith because I didn't know how I was gonna earn, and we was making right. good money back then. You know, mm -hmm. um, the, the black and brown faces that were coming through the receiving room for the first time. And, you know, I could still see their faces. And I immediately went into the public school system, Title I schools. I've been into over 50 to 60 different Title I schools, volunteering my time. No money, no grants, didn't even think anything mm -hmm. about it. But right. just going in with the information that I had because, you know, I felt, you know, there was something on my heart. I have information that could keep them from going out. We talk reform, but what are we doing to stop the next generation from going through the system? Everybody knows the term um, school to prison pipeline, but not too many people are talking about education starts at home. Working in these Title I schools, um, some of the schools are pre-K to eight. Mm -hmm. I'm in a pre-K room with 30 children, one teacher, no para, um, in the hood. Yeah. And the teacher said, okay, everybody, you know, take out your papers. So I'm walking around the classroom and I'm seeing that half the kids in the classroom in pre-K can't even pick up a pencil or a pen. No one taught them at home to 
put a pen or pencil in their hand and to write. So mm-hmm. now I'm looking around, half the classroom can read and write, the other half can't. So imagine that teacher now, one teacher has to create two different lesson plans to accommodate her children. So yeah. we got to stop playing games with this. You mm-hmm. know, um, a part of my organization, I work at um, Sugar Creek Charter School, middle school, and I work at the high school. I have a partner of mine that um, I work in the EC department, exceptionally challenge. We got to look at those numbers of those individuals that are coming through our EC department that will populate these prisons mm-hmm. without intervention. And so what my organization does is um, I have my partner. She helps parents fully understand the IEP. Imagine that child, the EC child, except the challenged child, and your child you know, is diagnosed with this, diagnosed with that. Those parents are uh, limited access of information themselves. They don't know how to read the information. They don't know how to, to fully get what the education system can afford them. So what we do is we create a system where we'll sit, where she sits down with the parents to let them know this is where your child is at. This is where you need to be to get your child to where he's at because they're just pushing these children through the system. I have a 16 year old child that can Ooh. barely read. Yeah, yeah, so I'm seeing, I'm sorry. I'm seeing a lot of that working with DJJ right now, how the kids are coming in there. The crimes that they have already at 14, 15, 16 years old is just, Ooh. it's scary. Yeah. It's scary. Go ahead, Terry. So the question I have is, it's actually good that Lorenzo came back in because it's primarily for him. Um, uh, the question is, they've been talking about closing Rikers for a minute now. What are some practical alternatives for dysfunctional prisons? Dysfunctional prisons? You got to get the into more, uh, I know. Let's say <laughs> deeper. You got to um, look at the... Um, Rikers Island is um, close to LaGuardia Airport. On a low tide, you can walk from LaGuardia Airport to Rikers Island. Mm. If you do some research, you'll find out that they're trying to get the land from Rikers Island so they could extend LaGuardia Airport and turn it into an international airport. It has nothing to do with the prisoners. It has all to do with the land. And if you look at the area of LaGuardia Airport, they got the new hotels. They actually upgraded. Before I came down to Charlotte, they were already upgrading the tower to the airport. So it's it's, it's deeper than the inmates that are on Rikers Island. The violence during 1987 to 1999 was worse than what's happening now. We average 40 to 50 razor slashings a month. For 12 years of my time on Rackers Island. So it, it has a lot. Yes, there's brutality on Rackers Island. Yes, they um they had to close and you know the, the solitary confinement units, units that I have actually physically worked in and have photographs of. But hmm. uh, it's deeper than you know what's going on, the brutality in Rackers Island. From Rackers Island's origins, it was always a violent place. So look wow. into the, the the property that Rackers Island sits on. But deeper than that, Rackers Island is a toxic dump site. Mm-hmm. Wait, what? That. It is. Rackers I've Island, done my research. Something with you. Rackers Island is a toxic dump site. Mm-hmm. I've lost over 30 friends that died with cancer in my jail, C-74 ARDC, alone wow to cancer they have areas on rikers island that have the the aluminum tubes with the with the ball that spins around to let the methane gas escape from the island there's areas on rikers island that you can't even smoke near they have signs that says no smoking wow wow there's a whole lot of a lot of things that are going on, on rikers island that the average person does not know but i've lost over 30 friends. Mm. So it is, yes. it is closed now? 
No, they're, they're, they're no. talking about closing. Oh, okay. I was about to say I heard the talk, but I didn't know that they yeah. were officially they've been closed. Talking, they've been talking for a long time. Yeah, yeah. So, Kenny, I'm going to get back to my question. Um, what has been the biggest challenge for freedom fighting? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I had a 10-year-old walk in the door. It's okay. Mm -hmm. We're all Understandable. Here. We all got them. <laughs> Our biggest challenge uh, continues okay. to be uh, okay. community Everybody. awareness and community support okay. um, and um, advocacy in this area. We do have a lot of supporters, but we also have a lot of people who are just misinformed, uneducated, and simply just um, are brainwashed and have blinders on. Right? And it's just mm. easier for them to believe that uh, everybody who has committed a crime has committed the most heinous crime and just has um, no right. way to uh, get on the pathway towards self-sufficiency. Yeah. Yeah. So for someone that is watching, um, we do have Miss uh, Cheryl Littlejohn. She's the owner of the Legacy Event um, Studio down in Gastonia. Um, and I believe this was for um, Lorenzo. She was asking for me to uh, connect her with you, Alen uh, Lorenzo. She has a nonprofit that um, works with uh, teens. Um, and so she would like for me to connect you to her. So I will make sure that I do that. And so um, for for those that are watching and for those like me who really believe in the fight that both of y'all are doing, how can someone like myself or, or, or Gray or Eric or, you know, other people that are watching, what can other, what can people do to help this crisis of, you know, those that are, that are reentering into the community to be able to have what they need? What can those that are listening be do to help this situation right now what is needed from the community first and then i'm going to ask what is needed from um from lawmakers so first what can people in the community do to help with this crisis of those that are re-entering re into the community and that's for kenny or lorenzo or both go ahead lorenzo <laughs> you go first <laughs> Well, I'll go first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the biggest thing that's needed for from um, the community um, almost supersedes the work that we're talking about and almost becomes uh, spiritual, where um, first just begin to love your neighbor, right? And in order to love your neighbor, you'd have to know your neighbor, mm -hmm. right? Um, and not want to be separ uh, separated from your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And then once 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 you begin to do that, uh, then you'll want your neighbor to thrive and be able to uh, benefit from everything that everybody else does and on the pathway to self-sufficiency and, and upward mobility. So we are constantly trying to educate the community that uh, you are much safer if those who uh, come from poverty and those who have uh, being convicted of committing a crime, are able to obtain sustainable employment, are, are able to have transportation, are able mm -hmm. to drink clean water and breathe free air, and are able to have safe, affordable housing. Um, that every statistic in the history of the world will state that a person who has those things are less likely to risk losing them. But when you take a population of people right. who have never had those things, don't see no pathway to obtaining them and don't have uh, no hope, then public safety does become a factor. So we are constantly trying to educate the community that to support this work, to love your neighbor, actually makes for a, a much safer uh, environment for us all. Yes, yes. Um, and so for Lorenzo, are you able to answer that question? What can the community do to help? And I also have someone say, what about nonprofits? How can other nonprofits um, help? So we'll let's stick with the community question. How can the community, those like me and you, your neighbors, as, as Kenny spoke of, help with this crisis? Well, we have the, you know, the boots on the ground. 
we have to allow these individuals to come into our community to give us the information and education about what's going on. You know, when I do our workshops um, and speaking engagements in colleges, I call us the experts. I have, you have the formerly incarcerated and you have a formerly um, former correction officers. I call us the experts. Um, get us into these areas, into the schools, into the churches, into, um, you know, the sidewalks. Also get this information out. You know, um, the average person is really not going to get this information from television. So that's, you know, one of the reasons why I created the Pop Museum to take information to people. You know, right. They're on the corner. They're just decision and we must get this information into the schools because that's where the children are at. And you know we have a couple of more weeks left and you know school is out. And after that, I'm gonna reach the masses. You know, we have to uh, mobilize, we have to collaborate and uh, put our heads together. Everybody has different uh part and piece of the pie, put our heads together and um continue to do what we're doing. Right. Okay, so now let's talk about the lawmakers, the government. Eric, I'm gonna let you chime in here. Where do you feel, um, everybody here, how do you feel like the government can, um, or I would say local government, I'm not even gonna go federal. <laughs> I'm gonna start with the local, because I, I maybe I'm wrong and you can correct me. place to start, Tiffany. Right, like you have to start home first, like right. uh, Lorenzo said. So, so how, how can we help in a community yeah level before so we it, go big. So the, the issues are there it, it's a it's a it's a demographic issue versus resource issue. So hmm. let's say um part of your part of your state congressional district is Henry County in in Georgia and let's mix that in with the Calb County. So those are two different two different areas, and they have two different needs. So when you go after, um, when you start legislating, you know, going to your politicians and saying, "Here's the needs I I have," but then you have the DeKalb people going, "Well, here's the needs I have." Then he's got to make a decision as to you know what what is going to be the focus of the legislation that I'm going to try to create, because you have a lot of different demographics going on in in those in those districts. And so, and there's only so much money to go around. So in my opinion, when you, when you look at communities that, that are at risk and you look at high crime communities where, or, or areas where, you know, you have people, you know, getting released in, from the prison systems back into society, it's going to take more than the little bit of state legislation budget. It's it's a it, they've let it get out of control so much and have, have taken so many resources away from those communities that now the problem is so astronomical and it's going to take a federal in, investment into those communities We're beyond the state now I believe I, I don't think there's much the states can do for these communities because they the, the populations of them are so large and the needs of them are so great. And it's going to take a dollar sign. It's just like what what uh, you know what we've talked about a little bit here. We're sending money to Ukraine in the billions, the billions, and we're ignoring these communities that have a direct need that could instantly, with with those resources, could instantly positively affect our society as a whole. And we're ignoring that. Our legislators are ignoring that. It's it's it, it's it's a catastrophe. And they could fix it, but it's going to take a monetary investment to go in there and do it. And then you have mm -hmm. to put your leadership in, in place. I believe it's a big, big circle. So you have your legislation, but I would enlist your spiritual leaders in these in these uh, conversations because those are the people that are on the streets. Those are the people that are shaking the hands, and and those are Indeed. the people that you you generally are going to you know, to, to show you in, in a good direction. They're, they're going to take you by the hand and put you in on the right path. Um, then you also have organizations like Kenneth that they've been there. They've done that. They, they're, they're hands on. Um, and even Lorenzo's uh, Lorenzo's doing a great thing too. So you've got, you've got these two great, great 
great leaders here that have been there, done that, seen everything. They know where the where the loopholes and the problems are, and they're they're exposing it, saying, "Here, here, here's the problems, and and here's our ideas as to how we can make a difference to improve those problems." Mm-hmm. So you go from the religion, you go, you have the legislation. Um, then I think you attack. I don't want to say attack. You need to go after the youth. Because that that's who you mold. They're still moldable. Youth is moldable. So you can you can put them in programs. I also think that there needs to be trade school opportunities in these in these communities because generally nobody wants to nobody wants to spend one hundred fifty thousand dollars going to college anymore. Hmm. Trade school, right. you get it done with a fraction of a fraction of the expense, and you get just as good a pay. And we have a huge need for trade school graduates. All over the place. Good luck finding an HVAC person. I'm just saying. I've been looking for one. Can't find. Yeah. One. So yeah. Th- those are opportunities that you can that you can put in the community and say, here's an education opportunity. Here is the spiritual opportunity. Okay. Now we 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 bring our legislation in because because the community has done a good job of uplifting itself with positive leadership. And, and programs that they're bringing to the table. Now you, you've attracted the federal government because, because they're always going to clout chase anything that, that is, is good. Cause that's what politicians right. do. So yes, I think do. it's a conglomerate of, of things that need to happen. Hmm. That's a very well researched position that you're taking there. Eric. When, when you uh, look at I spend all day looking at this stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that was some really good stuff, Eric. So I was thinking about what um, between what you were saying and then what Kenny was saying and about, you know, I I, kind of I want to say that I agree with you to an extent, Eric, when you said that it's more about, you know, legislation and, you know, um, having to go to federal level versus the resources, because based on what Kenny said, the resources are there. It's right. just, they're not being shared. They're not being, you know, circulated. They're, they're going to who they want to make it versus, you know, those that, that really, really need it. Um, and just in the last 10 years of being in social work, I've seen that there are right. more employers that are um, giving jobs to those that are, you know, re in, in reentry programs, they're giving jobs. There are, mm-hmm. uh, uh, free trade schools out there. I work with them one very closely with my DJJ. I went out and I found him and I use him regularly for my clients. They they offer free HVAC, CDL, all of that. So there are things out there. There are resources out there. It's just that they're not being provided um, for, for black and brown people because the resources well, are, are there. Um, so I feel like that's another issue that has to be addressed. Right is those people that are in place to provide it that are not providing it. You got to take it a step further as well, though. You you have to think about the fact that it's not, right. it, it is in fact focused on black and brown people, but it's also mm-hmm. black and brown people who have been incarcerated and they're coming out and trying to get back to their lives. And and their lives are, are you know, they're in the process of restarting and they have to fill out a job application and they're going to ask, do you have any felonies? Do you have any priors? Mm-hmm. What have you? And now it's a matter of regardless of your skill set yeah. and what it is you can and can't do. They're not going to they don't want to they don't want to take a risk. On impacting their customers and their clients with a, a, a felon who may not have been rehabilitated. Right. And, and I think that's an excuse that's used oftentimes um, mm-hmm. because they can. Yeah, because I mean, if they have they somebody just, without a charge versus somebody that does have a charge, regardless right. if the person with the charge has the skills or not, they they most likely are going to, which is wrong. But if that's Absolutely. that's the reality of the situation. Um, so, Kenny, what are you currently working on right now? Um, what is your focus uh, right now for freedom fighting? <clears throat> uh, we are very uh, <clears throat> housing uh, focused. Um, since we are developing our first um, development, yeah, um, that is our main focus. Uh, we also um, became the first reentry organization uh, in the history of Charlotte, specifically for justice involved. 
uh, families. So what we are trying to do with um, our housing resources, uh, the vouchers, the complex that uh, we are building, uh, and also any other housing assistance is to try to uh, solve for two things with the same resources, with the understanding that you know resources reach our community at a snail's pace. So <clears throat> what we are doing is focusing on our families who are who have children who are currently in CMS schools and in the McKinney-Vento mm -hmm. system. So when we do house one of um, our clients, um, we take one person out of homelessness, but we also take three children out of homelessness and offer the McKinney-Vento system utilizing the same awesome. uh, funds. Uh, okay. It is a difficult work to do that. But uh, we are strategically working on on that area, um, and also uh, working to train as many uh, master level social workers as we can for the, the the case management that is needed to give the family an opportunity. Well, we're talking about mostly uh, Tiffany and Eric and Terry. Uh, it's not handouts or gifts, right? But what we're talking about is an opportunity right? um, and to be able to remove excuses. And you can remove all excuses, provide all of the opportunities. And some people just simply are not going to do the right thing. We understand that. Right? Right. But we do not want that person to have them as valid excuse that I had when I was released that there just simply isn't any opportunities. Right? Yeah. There just simply isn't a pathway. Right. right? And when um, when we reach that level is when I will be satisfied. When there's equal opportunity, not only for those that are exiting um, jails or prison, but those that are returning from war, those who mm -hmm. have a gender that just happen to be a woman, right? And those who have uh, are LGBTQ, right? Plus, right? And those who have came here from another country, earned their uh, citizenship, um, and are trying to move their, their family forward. Right? So it is not just the population that we serve that we advocate for, but all equal opportunity, and let that person take that equal opportunity and make the decision for themselves versus society make the decision that you are incorrigible because of your skin, right. because of your gender, because of uh, your sexual orientation and uh, your native motherland or any other things that I just stated. Uh, and when you, you know, begin to think like that, as we have at Freedom Fight Missionaries, you uh, move outside of just serving a community and a population and you move over into humanity. And that is where we are at in this country now that these are humane issues, right? That range across a broad spectrum of intersecting uh, issues that right. um, have moved out of the inner city and over into rural America at a uh, pace that's just astronomical, right? Yeah. So the same things that I am sitting here discussing that we face um, in cities the size of Charlotte there are towns with populations that's less than 20,000 who are experiencing the same issues while having um, white, white skin, right? So we are now talking about a humane issue that almost supersedes race. And I am always quick to note that when you leave outside of major cities and get into to, to rural America. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. I have another question from the audience. Um, right, one more question, and I got to eat and take a shower. And, <laughs> it's, and it's for you, too, to brother. It's for you, so you got you got to be here right. for it. Right. 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 We, got, we got a couple more minutes. Go right. ahead, Kenny. Have you contacted your local housing development agency asking if they have any funding for development CDG BG funding or ARPA funding left over from COVID? Yes, I have, <clears throat> and we were one of the organizations that received both funding um, 
we have utilized those, those uh, funds <laughs> and we exceeded our uh, performance by okay. uh, 400% in some areas. And yep. we have um, recently been approved to receive additional uh, funding from both from both sources uh, while connecting other organizations uh, to those uh, funding sources as well. Awesome. So not only am I the founder and executive director of Freedom Fight Missionaries, I also serve in my third year on the Continuum of Care Board for Homelessness mm -hmm. in the Equity and Inclusion Committee in, in Mecklenburg County and vice chair of another board that focuses on street outreach and homelessness. So uh, not only do we try to stay abreast of any funding that's out, we also try to make sure that we connect others to those funding sources as well. Yeah. Kenny, what is your background, brother? Like that's, that's, that, what, what is your, what is your background prior to your conviction? And then since you, how long have you been out? I've been out now for 12 years. Okay. Uh, my background before you know, I went in at the age of uh, 24. Okay. And was, you know, in, in the streets before, before that. Uh, so there's not like a book I read or a class that I take, mm -hmm. have taken. This is, you know, based off of lived experience, divine intervention, and the prayers of my grandmothers who are no longer with us, who prayed right. for my faraway future. I mean, I don't have an, another reason as to you know how these things have happened other than <laughs> divine intervention because right. uh, history has taught us that man would never do this they right. would never try to help you they would never try to uh, provide land for you food for your family and the opportunity of uh, forward man would never do that so uh, we have to believe that i have to believe that it's just simple divine intervention because that's on right. paper i have a ninth grade education and a ged uh education wise that's it yeah wow that's yeah. impressive man yeah kenny um i've i've known him for a few years we we've intersected in different uh places in the community um and um just being able to see just in the last couple of years you know the accomplishments of freedom fighting in himself um he's very humble as y'all can tell um which is one mm -hmm. thing that i i love about him and and is you know i respect about him um and uh i'm just really really proud that he is continuing this work it's something that again i'm very passionate about so i was very I'm excited that he was able to make the time to come on the private room to share, especially um, with you know me now working with the the, ju uh, the juvenile system and just seeing firsthand what these uh, what the youth are are going through on that end. I've dealt with adults for for years, but just to see the children going through the system um, has been a, a, a completely different experience. And I just mm -hmm. really, really think that we need to to get into the schools more and get into the, the rec centers more and the, the churches, as somebody said earlier, because our our kids, they're going through so much. I The one, the young man that I'm working with right now, he told me he's lost seven friends and he's only 15 years old, seven friends oh, in, wow. the last, in the last two years, same community. Wow. And I'm just like, for a 15 year old to lose seven friends to violence it's 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 so much our kids are going through and um it's it's just a lot so um kenny thank you so much for coming on and sharing um freedom fighting uh missionaries and sharing you know your journey and what you're doing and what the needs are because it, it takes a community they say it takes a village but i'm gonna say it, it take it takes a whole it's gonna take a whole lot more at this point, not just a village. It's going to take much, much more than that. And um, I'm very uh, appreciative of you for staying in this fight because um, it's not one that is uh, easily met or easily faced. So um, I appreciate you using your story to uplift people, to help people. Um, and, you know, I'm here for it to support you at, and in any way I possibly can. Um, also want to thank Lorenzo. I see that he dropped off. Um, we will be interviewing him, um, in July, um, more on his mobile, uh, 
prison museum. Um, so we will do an interview with him as well. And then my special announcement is, is that we were up for the male co-host seat and you have two of the gentlemen here, uh, Gray and Eric, and uh, I couldn't make a decision. So both Gray and Eric are invited, if you will accept, to be the male co-host on the private room. So I hope that you all will uh, stay and stick around. Um, I am. I love the energy that y'all bring, and I really think that y'all just Y'all are going to be amazing and we're going to have a good time. But these community pieces are important. And so I wanted to make sure that you all were able to participate in this before becoming an official team member for the private room or the cast of the private room. So thank you, Kenny, so much for coming on. Thank you. And, um, <laughs> Uh, sharing with us, Freedom Fighting Missionaries. Thank you, Lorenzo. I see that you are back on for sharing um, your mobile uh, bus museum, and we're looking forward to having you back in July. And it looks like Eric gave me a thumbs up, and it looks like Gray gave me a thumbs up. So everybody out there that is watching, you have now met our two co-hosts, Gray and Eric. They will officially be joining the cast of The Private Room. So thank you, everyone. Have a good thank night. You. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in for our community every first Monday of the month. Have a great Make sure y'all go follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. TikTok. Uh, one thing you have to do is type in Freedom Fight Missionaries yeah. and we will come in, come up. Yeah. If you have Alexa, just tell Alexa to connect you. Shit. <laughs> yes, I'm going to drop the um, the uh, the link in the comments right now so that everybody can follow you. And we will be promoting you as well um, in the next couple of days. But I always promote you, uh, Kenny. So um, we will definitely make sure Absolutely. that um, we keep you on our radar and so that we can continue supporting you and letting the community know what you're doing. But also we want the community to take heed to what we said, how you can help. So if you want to help, you want to help the, the cause, volunteer, anything like that, resources, if you have jobs, anything like that, please reach out to uh, Kenny with Freedom Fighting Missionaries. Thank you, everyone. And have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Um, Eric and uh, Gray, if y'all can stay on. Yeah. Thank Are you. Are we no longer live? Uh, we're, we're, going, we're ending right now. Don't say nothing bad. Don't say nothing bad.